Welcome to the Criminologist Podcast. Our goal here is to educate and enlighten our listeners, focusing on the latest and greatest evidence-based interventions to help individuals desist from a life of crime and delinquency, and not only those factors which drive folks into crime, we also look at the reasons why people exit a life of crime. Also, we attempt to paint an accurate picture of that journey from the perspective of the justice-involved individual. Too often, our perceptions of those involved in the system are tainted by media-driven caricatures created to sell newspapers or movie tickets. This adds little to a healthy dialogue as to how to best address criminality. This podcast will avoid stereotypes and biases. We will endeavor to accomplish the first two goals in a way that keep you, the listener, interested and even entertained. And now, the host of The Criminologist, Joseph Arvidsson. Thank you. Thank you. You're all too kind. Hello and welcome to episode 32 of The Criminologist podcast. Glad to have you with us. I am once again taking a break from supervising our clientele, which we've been sharing with you all, to bring you yet another subject matter expert in the field. This week, very excited to be joined by Jack Cowley, joining us all the way from Wichita Falls, Texas. Jack is currently the National Director, Prison and Reentry for Alpha USA. Jack retired with 30 years of service to the state of Oklahoma, ultimately as a warden. His areas of expertise range from organizational leadership to prison management to prisoner reentry and, of course, developing community collaborations. We touch on all of that and so much more during our chat. I am delighted to be able to share my conversation with Jack for all of you. Please enjoy my chat with Jack Cowley, and I will see you all on the other side. All right. Well, normally, Jack, um, I kick off these interviews by asking our guests to tell our audience a little bit about themselves, their current work. However, you have such a rich and diverse background, we may, we may need to segment that up a little bit. So why don't we start out, just tell our listeners a little bit about your education. I know we have a lot of aspiring practitioners out there, folks just getting into the field. So again, maybe let's start out with your educational background, and then we'll start dipping our toe into your, your vocational work, maybe starting with your work back in Oklahoma. Okay, fine, and really good to be with you, Joe. Mm-hmm. Great uh, to talk to you again, Jack. I have a I have a bachelor's in sociology from uh, Oklahoma State University and a a master's in correctional administration, uh, also from OSU. And um, I've completed all my coursework for my PhD in organizational leadership from University of Oklahoma. Well, we'll dovetail back to that organizational leadership. That's one of my follow-up questions. But so then again, from there, vocationally, um, Oklahoma, you got into corrections in the facilities, correct? Yes, actually, I started out of college as a juvenile parole officer and um, moved back to the farm after I became a little disillusioned working with, I loved working with the kids. Mm-hmm. It was the parents that was bugging me to death. <laughs> so I moved back to the farm to farm with my dad, and it was a prison community, and um they, the uh, federal government, this was in 1970. The okay. federal government provided, I know exactly. Good context. Provided some grant money to the state to hire an inmate release counselor. And as I was, as I say to people, I was the only person in town with a degree that wasn't teaching school. <laughs> I applied for the job and I totally fell in love with it from day one. And that was in 1970. And uh, we worked with uh, trying to do as much as we could to make plans for the offenders when they were leaving and all that sort of stuff. Inmate release counselor. I love it. And then it looks like you climbed the ranks within the Department of Corrections, correct? Yeah, uh, deputy warden. And then my first warden's job was uh, I was so fortunate to open a new prison, a very old building 
uh, but uh, a new concept for Oklahoma. And the director at the time, Larry Meacham, just said, try whatever you want to try. It was a minimum security unit. And we, uh, it Taft, Oklahoma. And I had five years there of just really doing some great work in terms of reentry. And um, then moved up to a high medium custody prison. Um, and then retired in 1996. I really wasn't planning on retiring, but got into some political issues <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then started with prison fellowship after I, well, actually justice fellowship, but prison fellowship after I retired and was with them for seven years. And then I've been with Alpha doing inmate reentry uh, for the last 15. So try whatever you want to try. Sounds like, a eh, that's dangerously close to be careful what you wish for. What did that, what did that look like back in the days before, uh, you know, we, our listeners, at least we know about the, the, the nothing works Martinson proclamation. And then, you know, the, the birth uh, of evidence-based practices due to the Canadians. But what did that look like? Try whatever you want to f- try back in the seventies when we didn't have the, Again, the the advantage of of the research and the meta analysis and everything we we know about evidence based practices now. Well, I think if I could go back a minute, when I started working, because I was the first, and was was working alongside the parents of kids I went to school with. I was just twenty one. They really didn't know what to do with me, so they turned me over to the lifers at the prison. Okay. And they trained me. And um, so I grew up looking at corrections somewhat in a different light than I think we do today. Um, And I began to see the humanity um, of the inmates. So when I opened the new prison, I wanted to create a culture that was as much like the streets as possible. So these guys could practice. It was very evident that people would come to prison, live in a culture that was so void of normal um, street culture. Mm -hmm. They left, obviously they, it was like they'd never been in prison. It was like starting all over and falling back on the same behaviors and thinking and all that, that they had. So we had a hundred bed, community treatment center where inmates, we took them to Tulsa to work. So I decided to let them have cars instead of busing them. So those that had vehicles uh, got to drive their vehicles. We started a garage. So inmates were working on their cars when they broke down and the, the staff at the other, at the prison, the minimum unit uh, didn't wear uniforms. I gave inmates hard money to spend. There were no locks on any of the doors, but there was, uh, except on the armory. Um, we had dances. We had all sorts of activities with families. Um, it was, it was, it was quite something actually. So um, the those themes that you're articulating, Jack, you know, if I were to say something, to the public today, maybe not as much today as five or 10 years ago, but you know, that, that unfortunately that smacks of that sort of hug a thug mentality. We get that pushback. What was that like you doing those progressive type things in 1970s, Oklahoma? Joe, it was, it, it's so funny. I can, I know we, I know that we are brothers from separate mothers. <laughs> when I moved to the other prison, the high medium prison, they gave me a pack. The staff gave me a pack of huggy diapers as a present <laughs> because actually they called me the hug a thug warden. Uh, really, literally they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they also tried to run me off for the first three years, but that's another story. Um, it was a, um, it was an opportunity of a lifetime because it, it worked and we gave inmates an opportunity to make choices. We gave them an opportunity to fail, if you will. Mm-hmm. And then we literally provided 
interventions and because the staff, a lot of them were new, um, they were willing to allow us to try that. And the, the Correctional Officer Academy, a year after we opened, was also within that complex. So we had cadets that were intermingling with the inmates and the program. Uh, we did have a hard time in the beginning because the, the trainers that came in to train the correctional officer cadets um, were a little upset that in the dining hall, staff and inmates ate together. Right. And we actually had napkins on the tables. So they were a, a little, it took a while. Um, but I think it gave the cadets at least another way of looking at corrections rather than the old way of looking at corrections, which frankly doesn't work all that well. So it was, it was good for the, for that, from that standpoint as well. Well, and I can imagine too, the fact that as you noted, you had the Academy right there, so to speak embedded, you were, you weren't having to undo bad habits because as we know, culture, culture's king. Exactly. Exactly. Culture's king. So what is one thing that the public gets wrong as to prisoner reentry, you know, along the lines of misconceptions and biases um, from your lens? What does, again, the layperson just really not get about, you know, you mentioned making um, the prisons more, well, humane for lack of a better term, but, you know, we get a lot of folks that just bristle when they hear what do you mean they get televisions and air conditioning and, you know, I can't, I can't afford to send my kid to college. So why are we spending money on education for inmates? And it's, again, it's a, it's a, it's a big PR battle, but what's something again that, you know, you could educate the the public on some misconceptions that just, there, they get, go ahead. We had a, when I was a, I was a deputy warden and we were having some problems in the prison with the gang members. Mm -hmm. I, I had a senator come in, come into the prison to take a tour. And, he's in, and this prison was actually quarried. The building was quarried out of a local mountain. It was built out of granite rock. And he said, I want you to bring in rock and put it on one side of the yard and have those, have those SOBs carry it to the other side and back for eight hours a day feed them food that tastes like dog food. And I guarantee you, they won't come back to prison. And I said, Senator, there is nothing any worse than I can do to these people than what has already been done to them in most cases. You mm -hmm. can't punish in order to rehabilitate. It doesn't work that way. Their mind does not function that way. Um, so I think the the misconception, because what who was that wrote the book? The judge, ordinary responsible people, um, think that if you punish people, they change their way of thinking and become. Um, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to be punished that way anymore. So I won't do that anymore. Well, a lot of our guys and ladies don't think that way. They, it's not a and so people believe that if you go to prison and are punished, that you that you won't commit crime again. And if you do, you're just crazy and you need to stay in prison. Right. That makes sense. So that's the misconception that uh, prison works. And all you have to do is lock people up, let them out, and the majority will then do fine because they don't want to go back. Right, that you can punish people. And I, think um, that's, I think that's the primary misconception that the general public has. So what are, if I were to put you on the spot and ask, you know, what are the, your top three things that administrators, wardens, superintendents, even individuals, I guess, in the community correction setting um, and the like could do to improve that, that reentry process for folks coming out of the institutions, out of the jails and prisons? What would, what would some of those things be? that what could they do is that the question Joe? yeah kind of like your top three if you could just um if you were uh, 
you know, in charge of all the wardens and administrators and superintendents across the country and said, here's, here's the three top three things you could do to improve the reentry process for individuals being released from, from jails and prisons. Um, actually, when Jeannie Woodford was the secretary of corrections in California, this was after, this was probably 98, 97. She asked me to come out and talk to all of the, her wardens about how to change the culture inside prisons. Mm-hmm. Um, and that anything you can do to normalize the environment. Um, we created a law in Oklahoma way back in the day. It didn't have any teeth to it because it's just laying there ang- languishing and, and uh, to, hold, to hold wardens, directors of corrections accountable for a reduction of recidivism rates. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to then the deputy director, I won't mention his name, deputy secretary in California, uh, telling him about the bill that we signed and, and sort of my philosophy. And he actually got angry, jumped out of his chair behind his desk, said a few cuss words and said, I dare you to say that wardens can change the behavior of inmates. That's not our job and it's not possible. <laughs> um, so I think that we, um, we have to create that environment and normalize it. In at the prison I was at, the high medium prison for nine years, we actually went five years without it, without an assault of any kind. Um, because we gave the inmates opportunities to understand that they were better than what we had labeled them as. Mm-hmm. And we had a Glasser, uh, Bill Glasser back in the day, quality, what was uh, reality therapy. And we, we trained 12 inmates over a year's time to be peer counselors. And we had um, a TV station where we broadcast news, weather, sports. Everything was normal. We tried to normalize it as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, I got into trouble because we we were having, when I got there, it was a very militaristically ran prison, and we were having assaults. And so I decided to give every inmate that wanted one an opportunity to be, enroll in a hobby craft program. Mm-hmm. And we gave them a little box of supplies. And in that box was a box blade knife. My chief of security was going crazy. He said, Warden, you're giving everybody a box blade knife. I said, yeah, we're normal. Everybody now is equal. Everybody. <laughs> I mean, it was just a odd thing that it worked, but it actually did. And again, we, we didn't have now, in the end, um, two inmates broke into one inmate's cell and was trying to steal his cigarettes. He was working leather and turned around in his chair because they were behind him. And he cut one of the guys on the arm with the box blade knife. And then that caused an investigation. And then that prompted, obviously, the director of corrections to take away my box blade knives. But anyway, <laughs> it those just those, I mean, that's, obviously an extreme but it's a uh, normalizing the environment and really believe that we can change inmate behavior one big example and again the staff there were going crazy for the first three years trying to get rid of me because this was they it's comfortable isn't it joe for staff to work in the environment in which we've created for prisons all inmates are out to get you Mm-hmm. can't trust them they lie uh, on and on and on and we um we had an opportunity to provide uh, inmates that um, um to work with staff and we had plays where mm-hmm. i mean all that sort of weird stuff but it was it was the idea that people could change and we provided those interventions that were not not brushed with a broad brush at all but individually um 
we had a, you know how in most institutions, we we move inmates from one location to another, from one prison to another, don't we? In order to think that it, it controls the environment. So if you've got people that are starting gangs or you've got people that are not getting along with the program, you pick up 10 of them in the middle of the night, exchange them with another warden at another prison. And mm-hmm. you keep inmates paranoid half the time. So I put a word out at the institution that there would be no more, no more disciplinary transfers. Right. None. And the staff just went berserk. And I had this unit manager that was with me for years and years. And she came down to the office and she said, well, you're probably going to fire me. I said, what happened? She said, well, two inmates were playing cards and they were gambling. And one inmate couldn't pay his bill. So I overheard that they were going to beat him up in his cell. So I got them together because she knew we wasn't going to transfer anybody. And we got, so I got them together and decided that I would, (laughs) I would work out a deal. So I went down to the canteen with them and they exchanged, they, they exchanged canteen items and he paid off his debt. And then we started talking about gambling and all those things on the unit Mm -hmm. i said how did it work out she said well so far it's working out great i said well that's the way we're supposed to do things so it's that's that's what to make a long story answer to your question normalize the environment as much as possible right and then provide inmates the opportunity to fail Mm -hmm. and then and then manage those interventions. Yeah. When you were telling that story, I was thinking, and also when you talked about the warden who sort of had that attitude or your colleague rather of, you know, how dare you hold us accountable for changing behavior. (laughs) Um, And you know, this from working so long in, in a correctional facility there. And it's legitimate, but the top three priorities are of course, safety and security of the employees, safety and security of the inmates, and then safety and security structurally of, of the facility, you know, damage to the building and whatnot. But it's almost gotten to a point of success is not having a failure. Success yeah. is if you go home safe. Success is if an inmate doesn't harm themselves or harm somebody else. Mm-hmm. But, it's, but it's not on the other end of the spectrum of success is, like you said, releasing somebody back to the community as a changed and better person. It's just you know, again, it's such a minimalistic and I'm not trying to downplay because those are all important things, but yeah. Yeah. After, after years and decades, the culture just becomes, well, no success is if something bad doesn't happen. Success is, isn't if something good happens, if it's the absence of something bad happening that is right. then defined as a, a success. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. That's, the way, that's the way they look at it. Yep. We have a lot of uh, overseas listeners Jack in corrections and criminology here in the States, practitioners likely um, know all about NIC or the National Institute of Correction, sort of our big think tank over here that we that we look to. And I know you've got some experience um, working with them. So tell us about that. And, and then again, for folks um, who are overseas, maybe just in broad strokes, tell them what the National Institute of Corrections is all about. Uh, well, let me say this, that I've traveled the world, I mean, not profusely, but a lot, and have been to a lot of prisons all over the world. And I can say that they're all the same. So, <laughs> they're, I mean, some are a lot more drastic, but by and large, they're the same. Um, and the Institute, the National Institute of Corrections is a, is a federal government program that is uh, managed out of the Bureau of Prisons, um, and they they are a they are not they are a think tank, a clearinghouse of information, um, research, um, and I would I would recommend that your listeners in the, because they may be out of the country, if they haven't logged on or 
try to look up information from the NIC website, they're missing out because the information applies just as well in another country as it does over here. Right. And it was, a. I was on the board. I did, I did security consulting with them for a while. And, um, and then was asked by the Bush administration if I would consider being a member. So I, I was on the, uh, on the board member. So I, I was on the board for almost eight years. It was a, a wonderful opportunity to, be able to speak into some new and innovation, innovative things. And part of what I was about, my sort of gig on the board was volunteers um, and how we could begin to better incorporate volunteers into the system, which we all know, I think, um, basically, they're loved and hated at the same time by administration. Right. <laughs> so how, how could we, how could we actually begin to see volunteers as partners rather than just something that we have to log in every week and say, we have so many volunteer hours. And if we were paying money for these hours, this is what it would cost. Um, but then actually nobody pays them any attention until there's some problems. And we were telling uh, reentry coordinators and chaplains, don't just let volunteers come in and do whatever they want to do just to have the hours and just to babysit inmates, but really develop a strategic program for vol that volunteers can provide. Mm -hmm. Um and 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 affix it to the programs that the prison provides. So many times I think they're seen as totally separate opportunities for inmates and they just don't work really well. Mm -hmm, so, true. so anyway, yes, NIC is a is a great resource. Um and um one of the one of the programs I like I really like is when they when new wardens and new directors of corrections come on board, they have workshops um, for them and um, talk about what's new in corrections and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, so I, I, would, I, I would encourage your listeners to give it a look. Yeah, I will link their uh, NIC's website in the episode description of this show in the show notes. So if those folks want to go down that rabbit hole, which they should, they can just click on the link in the description of this okay. show. So we both started our careers. You mentioned you started back in the seventies. I started with the Florida department of corrections back in 1988, but really both started our careers before the, uh, not necessarily the advent of the risk needs responsivity model, but certainly before really took off. I'm a big proponent of that approach. Um, but I think the devil's in the details as to implementation. So after seeing the, um, the, the the model and sort of where we're at here in the states. What are some of your reflections on the risk needs responsivity model from from your perspective? Um, if it the concept is great, the implementation is the issue. As you said, the devil's in the details. I think that that wardens and I, I speak to them because I, I love that. I mean, I, again, I just love the whole idea of running prisons and, and I have a lot of respect for wardens. Um, even if I don't agree with a lot of them, um, but they, they have learned the language. And if I hear evidence-based practices one more time, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> And none of them know what it is, but they use it. And the same thing, it, the same thing with risk assessments and needs assessments. They understand the language, but they don't really believe, number one, probably that it works. But number two, they simply just don't have the resources, Joe, to, to implement um, the, 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 the aftercare piece. And it's just, um, 
it, it, therefore it just never, I just don't think it's ever caught on for that. You know, we even have inmates that are setting in, in prisons that have been recommended for parole and haven't completed certain programs yet. So they're not released. And, and it's one thing to have the assessments and another thing to provide the follow-up and, and they just never provided the follow-up uh, to meet scale. Anyway, that's how I look at it. So it, it really doesn't do a lot other than when ACA, I was an ACA auditor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's another story. Yeah. And, um, and you've put, you know, you've got your paperwork, you've got your files that you do all this stuff. Um, but then it never reaches the inmates, um, waiting list or a mile long. It just, so anyway, uh, the, the concept is wonderful. Um, it's the, it's the implementation that is negligible. Yeah. And I, feel that's really the next frontier. I mean, we're not really reinventing the wheel with risk needs responsivity, but as you said, it it gets into implementation. And even when you look at the research, I was I was researching an article last night that I'm working on getting published. And we always read when you read those effect sizes, it's it's always the caveat of um you know when implemented with fidelity. <laughs> you get the, you get these 20, 25 Thirty percent reductions in recidivism when implemented with fidelity. But as you said, when administrators just approach it as sort of a box checky, yeah, I've trained all my officers in assessment. Mm-hmm. I've trained all my my probation officers in adherence to the risk needs responsivity model. Well, butts in the seat does not equate to behavioral change. It certainly doesn't equate to fidelity. Right. Again, exactly. I think that's that really the next frontier. It's almost come back to bite us in the rear because it's an easy, it's a license to say we're we're trained in this. Well, being trained in something doesn't mean you're actually doing it. No, um, I promised you I was going to come back to this when you were mentioning your education. We're talking about it now. How important are those variables of culture and leadership when it comes to the implementation of evidence-based practices or I won't even say EBP. I'll just say when it comes to the implementation of yeah. what we're trying to do. Um, well, of course, I think, I think that, I think that is the, the, the yardstick that we need to use or that is used when it comes to implementation is leadership. I mean, I, I just, there, to me, there's just no way around it, and it, but it sets the culture. Uh, leadership sets the culture, and the culture determines the relationship. And I I truly believe that that it's the relationships that change people. For it's, I always said that programs were great, uh, substance abuse. Oh my gosh, we got them all, don't we? all kinds of programs to deal with behavior. But really, the programs are only vehicles for relationships to be created with those people that are seen as mentors, coaches, uh, people of value that others aspire to please, in a way, if you will. So it's a... um, the driver is the leadership mm-hmm. sets the culture. Right. Um, so it's, uh, and I think the people that, that uh, the speaking about wardens, I think we can speak about uh, probation officers, uh, anyone really in the field. Um, and I know a lot, I call them front end wardens that sit in their office. Uh, you, when, when I was doing AC audits, ACA audits, it was quite evident when you'd walk out on the yard with the warden and inmates didn't even know who he was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, so you have to create, rela- it's all in the relationships and that that's part of leadership that, that um, really, really rang my bell, so to speak. 
um, because I think it's I think that's the key to success for not just not just thinking uh, the way people think, but the behavior change. Or I had a I had a TV show every week at the prison called Tell It Like It Is. And I would talk about who's dealing drugs, um, who was stealing out of the kitchen, um, who was gambling and couldn't pay their debts. And we talked about the good stuff too. But it, before long, inmates would come up and say, Jack, please, just, okay, just don't, just don't put me on TV, but I, <laughs> I need to talk to you about what I did, okay? And and the staff began to understand that there really wasn't any, the most serious thing a person could do other, I mean, and I don't even want to talk about one taking another's life. I mean, that's just, but the worst thing you can do in a prison generally is, is escape. I mean, other than that, mm-hmm. there's not a lot of, I mean, nothing's a crisis. Right. We make it, we make a lot of things in prisons crisis. So, through that relationship, people can begin to to really value others, coaches, mentors, how to behave, how to think, how to talk, how to how to dress. And so, yeah, and I think it's got to be modeled. That leadership has to be modeled. It's not like coming up with all this this language uh, that leaders can come up with and then just not not demonstrate it, the value. So we have to, part of the leadership scheme is to demonstrate what it is that you want others to do and how you want the outcomes to be. Um, yeah. Too particular. I knew what I wanted. I, I knew what I want for, wanted for outcomes, but I really never told staff how to get there that they understood why we would want to get there, what it would look like when we got there. Uh, For example, I decided we, we, um, we gave UAs to all thousand inmates. The director at the time just had a fit. He said, Jack, what are you doing? Don't people are going to know we've got a drug problem in our prisons. (laughs) And I said, because we have to have a baseline, because I cannot stop drugs from coming into this prison as long as there's a need for them from the inmates. So why are we attacking the drug problem in prisons by keeping it out and developing all this crazy stuff, time-consuming stuff, to keep drugs out? Why not concentrate? on stopping the addictions and stopping the drug trade on the inside. So we made a commitment that we were going to be a drug-free institution. And I, we had a tower right in the middle of the yard. And so I, I, we put a pennant, made a big flag, put it up on top of the flagpole, a drug-free institution. We had bands playing. We had the senator come in and speak. We made a huge deal out of it. Um, We had inmates that were trained as peer counselors. Um, And it it was a way to say we are no longer going to ignore um, what is, I think, one of the, the main problems that we have in, in, prisons as drugs and but I let the staff then came up with their own agendas on how to get there and it was really cool mm-hmm. I mean so anyway I, I don't know if that did that answer your question about Lee <laughs> <laughs> see I told us our listeners at the at the kickoff you've got a rich and diverse background um we're up against the clock Jack, promise me you'll come back on the show. I want to um, talk about what you've been up to. I shouldn't say as of late. It's been the last 16, 17 years. Um, <laughs> National Director, Prisons and Reentry, Alpha USA. What I will do is put a link to Alpha USA in the show notes of this episode as well. But again, 
promise me you'll be back. And oh, well, uh, thank you for having me, Joe. And I, I hope that I haven't rambled too much for your listeners. You have not. It's all good stuff. All right, Jack. Thanks. Um, we look forward to when you join the show again. Thank you, Joe. God all bless. Right. Be well, Jack. Okay, big thank you once again to Jack Howley, National Director, Prisons and Reentry for Alpha USA, which, as noted, we really didn't even get a chance to talk about that aspect of Jack's life and career. We'll have him back to talk about that, I promise. I like having various perspectives on the show, which, if you're a loyal listener, you know that I like bringing in researchers. We've had them on the show. If you caught the episode we did just a little bit ago with David Adams, a formerly justice-involved individual, that was great having him on the show to get the perspective of an individual who's walked that journey. And I also like having subject matter experts like Jack on because, again, as we referenced in the show when we were unpacking the risk needs responsivity model. The devil really is in the details as far as implementation goes. So I like, again, tapping into the expertise of someone like Jack who can show us that process, um, warts and all. Okay, uh, as noted, I will leave a link to Alpha USA, Jack's current endeavor in the show notes for this episode, as well as the link for the National Institute of Corrections, which again, as we both noted, is a cornucopia of resources for anybody out there looking to take their evidence-based practice game up a notch or two or three. Okay, we will be back next week with a fresh episode. In the meantime, you may contact the show or reach out to us through our website, the Paragon Group, LLC.com, for training or presentations as to evidence-based practices and or implementation, or of course, the topic of desistance from crime. Space permitting, I'll leave a link in the episode description of this show that will direct you straight to the Paragon Group website, or if you have any questions, feel free to contact the show directly through our email, the criminologist podcast at gmail.com. That's the criminologist podcast at gmail.com. Remember to follow us through our Facebook page and or Instagram page at the criminologist podcast. New images are being added all the time to our feeds. You don't want to miss out on that. You can also connect with me, Joseph Arvidson on LinkedIn and follow both the Criminologist Podcast and the Paragon Group on our respective LinkedIn pages. Lastly, if you have not already done so, subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Criminologist, for additional content as to what you've heard on this podcast or previous episodes. Merchandise is available. And lastly, if you believe in what we're doing here on the show, please spread the word Tell a friend or a coworker or a colleague about us. Ask them to subscribe to the show. And of course, do so yourself if you've not already done so. And always remember, folks, there's no them. There's only us. The stars at night are big and bright. Deep in the heart of Texas, the prairie sky is wide and high. Deep in the heart of Texas. The Criminologist Podcast is a production of the Paragon Group, LLC. For speaking engagements, interviews, program design, training opportunities, or to contact the host, please visit us at theparagongroupllc.com. Click on the Contact Us tab in the upper right-hand side of the page. Be sure to give us a five-star review, and thanks for listening. The thoughts, statements, and opinions of the host and cast members do not necessarily reflect the views of their employers and are those of the host and cast themselves. Any discussion regarding client statements, behaviors, actions, or crimes are purely fictional and are used only for the purposes of example. Any examples that could be deemed to be related to an actual individual or individuals are incidental.